Hey everyone. Um, are you all ready to get modular pill? You all right? Um, so I'm Yaz. The talk I'm going to give today is first uh, from Celestia about assessing security property of modular blockchains. Um, so my work at Celestia Lab, I'm the head of developer relations at Celestia. Um, before that, I worked for a couple years on the protocol that Rao side uh, with Celo. And before that, for a couple years, director of developer relations at Ethereum Classic. Okay, so what is a modular blockchain? So a modular blockchain decoupled the core function of a blockchain. Execution, settlement, consensus, and what we call data availability. So in, in the example on your left, you have what we call a monolithic blockchain. It contains execution, settlement, consensus, and data availability all wrapped up in one. On the modular side, we're separating it. So you have execution, you got a settlement layer if you, um, let's say you have a roll up on the execution side that need to settle somewhere, you would have that settlement layer. And finally, you have consensus and data availability separated. So here, we're separating all these different functionalities of a blockchain in what we call a modular blockchain. Celestia, cover consensus and data availability. So with Celestia, we don't have a settlement layer, but you can deploy a settlement layer that connects with uh, Celestia. And we don't have execution environment, but you can deploy execution environments um, on top. So the way this talk is gonna go, I'm gonna talk about those properties of modular blockchains. At the same time, we're gonna assess the security properties um, on the layer one side. So what is the data availability problem? It's how can you, you know, nodes be sure that, you know, when you have a new block produced, uh, the entirety of the transaction data have been published. So as you all know, there are two different types of blockchain nodes. There's what we call a full node. So a full node downloads and verifies all the transaction data in a block. It also has a higher barrier to entry. So with a full node, you need a lot more RAM, a lot more computing power, a lot more storage power in order to run a full node. And it's ran by a minority of users. With a light node, you only download block headers. This is the current design of light nodes, um, as you can see in Ethereum other places. Uh, it, you don't verify the data. And it has a lower barrier to entry. You can run it on a Raspberry Pi, you can run it on your phone, and it can be used by a majority of users. So what are the solutions to the data availability problem? So one approach we take with light nodes is at Celestia, instead of checking for block headers, what we're doing, we're requesting fraud proofs from full nodes if a block contains invalid data. On the full node side, a full node can generate fraud proofs for a block to check if it contains invalid transactions. There's only one issue though with this design. Full nodes need to have all the transaction data in a block in order to generate a fraud proofs, and that's part of the data availability problem. So we need a way to enforce it. So if I'm a block producer, I'm a validator, I can publish a block header, like just to commit of a block, without publishing any of the transaction data. So we need a way to enforce publishing of all data. So Celestia solved this by decoupling execution from consensus and introducing what we call data availability sampling. So with data availability sampling, what you can get is a light client can with data availability sampling, check less than 1% of a block in order, um, sorry, check less than 1% of the block to check um, whether the block is valid. And this is what we call a trust minimized light client. It improves scalability by reducing the cost per user to operate nodes and verify the network. So the more nodes in the network that you have, the more light node, the bigger the block can be. You can actually increase the block size. 
So when we say that you can increase the block size, it's because of the modular properties. So when you separate execution from consensus and data availability, what do validators do on Celestia? They're not verifying transaction. Celestia doesn't care about the transaction, if it's valid or invalid. All validators do is order transactions. So with data availability proofs, is we use something called erasure codes. It's the same kind of technology you find in CD-ROMs, QR codes, um, to check with a high probability if the data has been published. So it creates an interest in poverty. For 100% of the block data to be available, only 25% must be published by the validator. Um, malicious block producers can withhold more than 25% of a block in order to withhold the entire data. So let's talk a little bit about the consensus side of Celesta. So we implement Tendermint. Tendermint, as you all know, found in the Cosmos ecosystem. We don't reason about the validity of the transaction. We don't care if your transaction is valid or invalid. That's up to the settlement layer, the execution environment to verify the transaction. Um, it also, um, you know, validity rules are enforced by the uh, client. So we're going to now talk briefly about the architecture of Sovereign blockchain, then we're going to talk about the security properties. So Sovereign changed on Celesta. So we have a concept called rollups, on Celeste, like a Sovereign rollup. And they're basically, you can deploy a Sovereign rollup, allow it to connect to Celestia data availability layer, and you have shared security model. Because um, it's more scalable, and the trust assumption of a rollup um, are provided by data availability sampling. Uh, Sovereign chain, they share full security with each other. We get that property from the data availability layer. Each chain does not need its own validator. Sovereign chain can become sequences. It's similar to Cosmos, but you don't need multiple validator set per uh, zone. So one really good tweet that could, you know, talks about this is Celestial Vision is a marriage of the Cosmos Sovereign Interoperable Zones and the roll-up centric Ethereum with shared security. Um, so let's talk about the stack configurations. So this is a really good diagram by Peter Watts. It talks about how do you get modular stack configuration on an Ethereum-centric or a Celestia-centric uh, design. So the first one is, as we know it today, Ethereum can be with data availability, consensus, settlement, execution, become one monolithic architecture. This example, if I can you know, deploy a smart contract on Ethereum, I'm participating in the monolithic architecture. The second approach is the roll-up approach. So Ethereum in this model as a modular blockchain can take cover data availability, consensus, and settlement. So here, with the execution, if you have optimism, you can deploy optimism, it becomes your execution environment, and then you can settle on Ethereum. There's another concept of Validium, where you can get the data availability off-chain, Ethereum just provides consensus and settlement, and then you have a roll-up that can deploy um, and settle on Ethereum. Uh, with the Celestia-centric design, we have the concept we covered before, Sovereign Rollup, where Celestia provides data availability and consensus, and settlement and execution are by your Sovereign Rollup. There's a settlement rollup example. So in this example, Celestia does the same thing, data availability and consensus. Settlement, you can deploy your own settlement layer. It can be an EVM-based, again, you know, a settlement layer. It could be Solana-based. And then you also have an execution environment that can deploy on top of it. And finally, the concept that we call Celestium, it's actually one of my favorite examples, is basically, let's say you're optimism. You can settle on Ethereum if you want to, if you're culturally aligned with Ethereum, but you can still get data availability from Celestia option. So how does Celestia improve scalability? So we talked about data availability, but sometimes it's harder to like think about data availability. So a good way to think about data availability problem is to think about a solution to the big block problem. So what is the big block problem? 
The more you increase the block size to allow for more transactions, the more resources and infrastructure is needed for network growth. So this will centralize the network among those who can afford to run those nodes, posing what we call a security risk because of centralization. Solana is a great example. So Celestia's modular architecture solved this problem by providing a scalable data availability layer and uh, data availability sampling. And validators, they don't have to verify a transaction, they just order the transaction. We have a notion of shared security here. So if you compare Cosmos as a monolithic ecosystem to Celestia, in Cosmos, like the zone, they combine execution, consensus, and data availability, and they connect with each other with IBC. IBC is not that secure here because each chain has its own roll-up uh, validator set. Celestia had the modular, uh, the modular architecture um, because Celestia is providing consensus and data availability. They have the shared security that roll-ups can just deploy on top. So now we're gonna introduce the concept of what we call a modular block and the properties of a modular block. So when you think about regular consensus models like Tendermint, there's a notion of a block being valid or invalid. So valid and invalid blocks are monotonic. Monotonic in the sense that if a block is valid, it's valid because the validator verified the transaction. If it's invalid, that's it, it's invalid. Um, and they're um, also deterministic. You can determine based on the you know, tendermint validator set when the block is being produced. In modular blockchain, we have a different concept. Is the block available or unavailable? Available blocks are probabilistic and rather than deterministic because you're doing data variability sampling in order to determine with probability, high probability, that the block is available. Available blocks are assumed monotonic. So we assume they're monotonic because you know we verify that they're you know the data is available. Unavailable blocks, they're not monotonic because once a, we have several different properties in a modular blockchain when we have unavailable blocks and how to handle them. So this is what we wanna talk about, data withholding attacks. So this is common in modular blockchains, and like as a feature, like you know, as an attack property, but it's also super hard to execute, but we'll go over how you can you know, perform that attack. So we have several scenarios, scenario one, Dishonest validators collude to hide a block. Now you do need two thirds of the validator set in order to collude, and then you can, you know, you hide a block, and then you commit additional blocks on top, and then you reveal the first block's data. So what happened in this scenario? If a block is seen as committed but data unavailable, light clients continue to perform data availability sampling within it until the, you know it passes. Otherwise, after a specific time frame, the node shuts down. And also with a full node, if a block is seen as committed but data unavailable, full nodes continue attempting to download the entire block until either it's downloaded or after a time frame, you know, the node halts. Scenario number two. So here, a dishonest majority collude again, two thirds of the uh, validator set, to hide a committed block. But then they commit a second block at the same height during a the time frame, then reveal the first block later. So what happens here is there's a port choice rule because you're using Tendermint, um, the chain has to halt because it can't decide which, is the, you know, which port is the correct one, right? And consensus is required to decide for choice rule. Um, it, but consensus on the social layer side. So essentially, if you do want to shut, like if you do want to attack, this is the data withholding attack that would actually halt the network. Um, and then there's the property of like the social layer needs to decide on a for choice rule. Now, you can, like, I think it depends philosophically on what you'd consider an attack. A chain halt is considered a form of attack, but 
because there's been happening a lot of time before, it, you know, you can use the social layer to restart the network versus allowing invalid, like an unavailable block with invalid transaction to be accepted by the node. The node would either reject the block than actually accept it. So, I mean, like briefly talking about the social layer, it's like, a, like my own definition of it is, it's any off-chain decision making that impacts on-chain outcomes. So the DAO fork, wasn't first done on chain. There was a lot of consensus and like, you know, on the social layer, people discussing what to do. Bitcoin inflation, when Bitcoin inflated through the inflation bug, miners had to coordinate until, you know, decide on the port choice rule. Um, Solana, I mean, Solana's, um, you know, when they went through a lot of consensus bug to actually halt the chain, this is really, really like um, hard work and it's like, um, they still decide with their validator to restart the network. That, that's the social layer. Multi-sig decision making. If you ever participated in a DAO, you'd know that most of the decision making happened on the social layer. On-chain voting is only a formality here. And with that, thank you. Um, if you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Um, this is my email, and if you want to message me on Telegram, ask me a question. Okay.